Welcome everyone to our inaugural AJT Stat Chat. I am uh, Joe Kim. I'm the director of the Kidney Transplant Program at the University Health Network in Toronto, Canada, and also a statistical editor at AJT. Uh, it's my pleasure to host the, the first Stat Chat uh, for the American Journal Transplantation. Uh, this series is really uh, came about uh, sort of a brainchild of our current editor, editor-in-chief, Dr. Uh, Sandy Feng, to really highlight uh, uh, some methodologic issues or, or approaches to studying organ donation and transplantation well, and deliver it in a digestible format that uh, complements uh, a, a, the published work that, that you'll be seeing in the, in the journal. So the, today we're gonna present uh, a paper that's gonna be published quite soon um, that's been written by uh, my colleagues here today, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, David Klassen and Mr. Darren Stewart, uh, who are uh, not strangers to the uh, to the transplantation community. And so I'm gonna ask them to individually uh, uh, introduce themselves and then we'll sort of go on to present what the topic will be that for discussion today and uh, go from there. So Darren, please, you would start off. Uh, yep, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Kim. It's um, an honor to be uh, in invited here to be a part of the first stat chat. I'm Darren Stewart, I'm a um, Associate uh, Director of Registry Studies at NYU Langone Health. Uh, formally spending uh, a decade or more in at UNOS as well. Great. David? And, and I'm David Clausen. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at, at UNOS, and I've been in that role for a number of years now. But prior to that, I was a uh, transplant nephrologist for, for a good many years uh, at the University of Maryland, where I spent really the bulk of my academic uh, career. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. So today's topic will be on uh, waiting time. A uh, very important one that I think many of us sort of kind of take for granted in terms of how we measure it and how we sort of uh, talk about it. But uh, uh, Darren and David have really done a wonderful job with the piece around how do really do we do we really understand it and what are better ways that we can actually measure it and and talk about it. So I want to ask you, Darren, if you want to share your slides, and then we'll sort of go through some questions and answers to try to highlight these issues. Wonderful. Okay, so um, a, a great uh, a, a title for the first uh, uh, sort of uh, session here today, Kaplan, Meyer, Cox, and Competing Risks, Estimating How Long It Takes to Get a Transplant. And so uh, I thought I'll start off, uh, and maybe David, I'd ask you to sort of provide us a bit of a context to think about uh, the issues we're discussing today. So what's the problem we're tackling and, and why should we care? Why is it important? Yeah, yeah, Joe, thank you very much. You know, waiting time is really a, kind of a fundamental feature of, of our transplant system, you know, and it's part of NOTA. It goes way back to the beginning of, of the OPTN, if you will. Um, and, and it really is a, a, a core concept that I think everybody is familiar with. Um, you know, the question, and, and we get it all the time, is, you know, how, from patients, how long will I wait for a transplant? Um, you, you know, you know, so as you know, the contractor for the OPTN, if you will, we have a patient services group and we have a phone line. And I asked them uh, yesterday, you know, about this issue and they said, yeah, that, you know, how long will it take to, for me to get a transplant is a question that they receive multiple times every single day. Uh, this is something that is in the foremost uh, part of the experience of patients on the wait list, obviously. Um, and, and it's, you know, a fundamental question, but ironically, it is one of the hardest ones to answer. You know, why is it so difficult to answer this? You know, we, you know, as we all realize, we live in a data-driven world, and it's, you know, often uh, said that arguably transplantation is one of the most data-rich fields, you know, in, in all of medicine. Um, but, but I think you, you could argue that our experience as, as clinicians or providers sort of creates a bit of confusion, you know. We see patients in our clinic every day. And, you know, we know how long they waited for a transplant. Uh, you know, they tell us. Um, but I think what we, and I think that kind of colors how we think about, you know, waiting time. Uh, and we tend to tend to kind of forget about the patients, you know, who remain on the list, you know, who don't receive a transplant, uh, you know, or patients, you know, unfortunately, who die on the waiting list. And, you know, these, these people recede sort of from our consciousness, I suppose, uh, but it is, you know, as you know, in a statistical sense, it's it's a competing risk. Um, and even though we don't think of them often, perhaps, uh, you know, they remain, you know, in the statistical background for sure. Uh, 
um, and, and, and it is something that is important. So I think, you know, how we approach this issue of waiting time, you know, really needs to be sorted out and, and some structure around it, I think is really important. And so, you know, I'm gonna turn it over to Darren to kind of get into a little bit of, of how, you know, he approached this and, and, and what we found. Great, thank you, David. So Darren, what would you say would be the current state then of, of this issue and, and uh, uh, what has your sort of study uh, helped to do to advance it? Yeah, um, yeah, so I mean, I think the current state is uh, number one characterized by unfortunately dissatisfaction uh, among consumers of transplant information. I think uh, a testament to that is what Dr. Clausen alluded to a moment ago, People are calling in to, to ask about what is the, the sort of the time to average time to transplant, typical time to transplant, because there's an information void. It's hard to find this information easily, uh, if at all. Um, uh, and, and the question is, is, is why? Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment as well. So dissatisfaction is out there. Uh, people are hungry, in particular patients, not only patients, uh, the general public, um, policymakers, um, others in, interested in this information. Uh, there's also a state of confusion, uh, I believe, as well, that it's be, you know, become more clear to me in, you know, in looking at and uh, reviewing papers for, for journals and things and, and just uh, talking with other transplant researchers. There's confusion about this whole issue that, again, Dr. Clausen alluded to, competing risks. How do you handle that when you're, um, when you're trying to estimate the time to a particular event uh, in this case, uh, from a patient for a patient on the waiting list. So what are competing risks? I think we talked a little bit about that. Uh, a classic example is the transplant waiting list. You might be primarily interested in time to deceased donor transplant, but that's not the only thing that, that, that's not the only outcome that a patient could experience. They might actually receive a living donor transplant or be removed from the waiting list for other reasons. Those are competing events. How do you handle those analytically? Uh, and that's where the complexity and, and confusion uh, comes into play. And a little bit of history, I think, is insightful uh, for me in particular, looking back two decades. I can remember when sort of novel analytic methods became in vogue. There, you know, methods for competing risks in particular were developed and disseminated. And folks in the transplant community caught wind of these methods and rightly so embraced them for analyses of Trans, uh, of, of transplant waiting list outcomes because the methods are quite fitting in that context. But what I think happened is that the, the pendulum actually swung a little bit too far uh, toward the use of these new methods um, at the expense of traditional methods like Kaplan-Meier regression and, and Cox regression. And I distinctly remember when learning these new methods, uh, given the impression that uh, the use of anything else was wrong, and you sort of had to, had to use this one method. It was it was an all or nothing approach, um, and I think that all or nothing approach led to the you know, part of the state we're in now, uh, which assumes an all or nothing mindset for patients and consumers. That everybody sort of thinks about uh, transplant information and time to transplant in the same way, and the community found itself in what I call methodological handcuffs. Well, we've got to kind of use only this method, and yet. Um, Part of the downside of the newer methods that is oftentimes you don't oftentimes you don't get a simple summary measure of the median time to transplant on average how long is it time uh, how long does it take to get a transplant overall and by different blood types or different parts of the country and so this inf information void was kind of a part of the problem uh, that our study aimed to help just shed some light on uh, maybe different ways of um, estimating time to transplant and maybe moving away from I an mean, all or nothing. Uh, approach or a more complementary approach. Fantastic. Um, did you want to highlight then, because uh, you mentioned the term competing risk several times, and David did as well. Uh, what what is sort of what are sort of the sort of the key things to consider when distinguishing that from more traditional approaches? Yeah. So uh, just a, a quick, hopefully, slide here, but I, th I think it's helpful again because I mentioned a, a state of dissatisfaction, but also a state of confusion between different methods that have been available and that have uh, been developed and are a little bit newer, as I said, newer being the last 20 years as opposed to uh, longer before that, the methods on the right um, were developed to explicitly account for uh, competing risks. And these are uh, cumulative incidence function methods or fine and gray regression. 
that were based on uh, and adapted from the traditional methods of Kaplan, Meyer, and Cox. And so the whole point of, of, of our taking a step back and assessing the information void in time to transplant in today's world was to evaluate um, the differences between these two methods conceptually and philosophically. What are, what are they telling us? Uh, what kind of different answers might we get with the one set of methods versus the other? And is there room for both in a complementary sense to help fill the information void? And we, we kind of uh, concluded that the answer was yes, but it's, a, it, it's critical to understand the differences in what these methods are, are, are telling you and what assumptions are, are behind them. So the traditional methods focus on a primary outcome. Let's say in this case, time to deceased donor transplant, all the other things that can happen uh, to an individual on the waiting list, we're not so much interested in in, in this primary analysis. So we'll censor them and, and assume we don't know what would have happened in terms of time to transplant if those other uh, events uh, happened instead. And so it, it must be recognized these traditional methods then and any of the, the me measures that come out from them like a median time to transplant are based on a theoretical sort of counterfactual world uh, as opposed to the, the competing risk methods which, which are, are, are more sort of real world and, and pragmatic. Is there room for theoretical and counterfactual based results? There, there clearly is. And I, one example, a little bit different from time to transplant, is actually trying to quantify severity of illness among patients on the waiting list. All right, so that's essentially looking at um, time to, to mortality without a transplant. If you use the, the uh, newer, quote unquote, competing risk methods, you actually don't get what you're looking for. You, you get answers that don't make sense in this context because oftentimes very sick individuals under uh, organ allocation policies today will get transplanted, averting, averting death on the waiting list. And so what you need to do is actually uh, imagine this counterfactual world without a transplant, what's the, the likelihood of death and time to mortality among patients to estimate severity of illness, developing, developing a MELD score, developing the um, severity of illness part of the LAS score. So that's one context in which um, I recognized you know, years ago that it's not all or nothing. We can't just bank everything on these methods. And I think time to transplant um, can be thought of that way as well. And we can estimate the, the average or median time to transplant using these methods much more readily than with the methods on the right. But we must, we must couch that or caveat those numbers because they assume that a transplant will eventually be received. And we know that that is not a guarantee but still patients, I think patients um, are okay with that. Patients have, have, have said they want this information and, and I think we shouldn't assume that, that uh, patients can't kind of understand um, that, you know, both of those things at the same time, that there is no guarantee that these other negative outcomes can happen. Be aware of that in your decision-making. Um, but on average among patients who do get a transplant, um, we can give you a median time to transplant using these traditional methods and importantly, I think the ability to do so provides a bulwark in a sense, uh, some protection against some really poor, highly biased methods that our paper also shows, uh, some very tempting, convenient, and overly simplistic methods of just calculating uh, the median time to transplant among patients that got a transplant. So you're ignoring patients still waiting on the list, and, you, and, and our, our results show that those numbers are very, very highly biased. So if, if folks are interested in a, a sort of an optimistic view, assuming I'll eventually get a transplant, what's my typical time uh, to transplant? These methods on the left can help. A few other side notes, just analytically, because again, there's a lot of sort of confusion about this and it takes, uh, it takes a lot to wrap your head around. I'm not necessarily the end all be all expert, uh, but I've tried to really get myself up to speed on these distinctions because they're important. You have cause specific hazards that are estimated with the traditional methods versus sub-distribution hazard methods estimated with the competing risk methods. methods. The traditional methods are actually um, much, more much more applicable when your focus is on etiological inference or the causal effect of patient factors like disease mechanism or blood type on a primary outcome of interest like mortality or time to transplant. But they're not so great when you're looking at uh, predictions. Um, so the event probabilities under this, uh, the, the traditional approaches uh, will 
uh, exceed one, and, and, and that doesn't really make sense. So if you're focusing on prediction of what will happen in a real world context, um, all the possible events that could happen, uh, these methods are more appropriate and the event probabilities will nicely sum to one. A lot more could be said about these. There's a lot more nuances. There's some great references out there that have been very helpful to me. And I'll, I'll show them here for a moment for folks that are interested. Uh, one of them is actually a blog post by well-known uh, author and statistician Paul Allison, uh, really highlighting how it's not an all or nothing. Both of these methods, really depending on what question you're trying to answer, have value in a competing risk setting. Wonderful. Thank you, Darren. That was really well uh, explained. And I think just to sort of uh, quickly summarize some of the points that you made, which are extremely important. One of the key ones, I think, for our listeners is that uh, traditional approaches that uh, that look towards uh, defining median waiting times is among those individuals who are transplanted, yes, are quite convenient and readily uh, accessible but can be very biased. And you'll see uh, how that translates to uh, when, uh, in terms of the numbers when you, when you read uh, Darren and David's paper. So a very important point there. So the convenient uh, way to do so is, is not necessarily the right way. In this case can be highly biased. And uh, I think the other major important point here is that um, it's uh, usually the case that we, we should not be using methods in isolation, but using it in, uh, in a complementary way to uh, to tackle the problem at hand. And so I think the points that are raised here, uh, pros and cons of the different approaches uh, of Kaplan-Meier versus uh, more co formal competing risk approaches, but they can actually also be quite complementary. And I think uh, David and, and Darren, you do a wonderful job of highlighting that issue in your paper as well. And so I'm sure our readers will look very much forward to, to reading that. Thank you so much there, Darren. So maybe David, I'll, I'll take it to you at this point and ask you the question, well, you know what, so what do we do with this now? What What's the next step? And is there uh, a recommendation here that's come out that you think uh, could uh, impact a uh, practice or even policy? Yeah, I, I think it's pretty interesting, the results of the paper. Um, you know, uh, the statistical aspects of it are, are interested, interesting from a methodological standpoint, but, but you know, how do you translate that into, uh, you know, real action for clinicians? What are the implications of it? And one of the striking findings to me was the difference in waiting time, uh, you know, whether you can, when you compare it, waiting in active status versus waiting uh, versus total waiting time. You know, patients come, you know, in and out of that, kidney patients come in and out of active status on the list all the time. And I think as clinicians, we sort of don't necessarily appreciate the potential consequences of doing that because the time to transplant uh, you know, in active status versus total time is huge. The difference is quite large. And I think that really kind of highlights, or it should, in my view, highlight the need to really actively manage your wait list and make sure that patients are in active status and as, as much of the time as possible. Uh, because, you know, that does have a significant impact on when they will get a transplant and the consequences of extended time on the you know, there are negative consequences to, to you know, the time that you spend on the wait list. Um, and so I think those are very real, real world applications or things that, that clinicians can think about uh, as a result of the data that we have presented. Great, great, fantastic. Anything uh, th uh, as it relates to how UNOS will now report or the OPTN will now report a waiting time or is there any sort of thoughts around next steps based on the work? Um, you know, I, I, I think much of the reporting uh, wait time comes really through the SRTR, I suppose, um, and not directly uh, from UNOS. But I think, you know, as we, uh, to the extent, to the degree that we can sort of standardize an approach uh, to doing that, I think it will we'll add clarity um, to it. And I think it, it does highlight the ability to, uh, to assess wait time in a relatively small interval. Uh, following a, a, a policy change. And that's very important. Uh, one of the things that we noted was that following the CAS 250 change, if you will, that in fact waiting time uh, has declined. And I think that is a, a very important thing that we need to be aware of. Um, so it affects, I think, policy development, how we analyze policy, how rapidly we're able to do it. Um, and I think that is a, a goal that we all share is to kind of keep a system that is nimble and, and responsive. 
Great. And, and I think that that's a very sort of uh, measured way to sort of approach this because this is a study and we've, we've looked at sort of, sort of some, some of the interesting findings, but at the end of the day, translating it into you know, practice and policy has other potentially unintended consequences in, that we need to consider. So that's going to require a, a separate forum with, with other stakeholders at the table to, to make those decisions. So, well, this was a great, uh, a great start to the Stat Chat series. Thank you both for, for uh, spending the time and sharing your expertise and knowledge. Uh, I know that the readers of AGT will, will really enjoy this paper, and I think it'll generate a huge amount of discussion. And uh, thank you again for those of you who are listening. I hope you return to, to share uh, or to, to uh, engage with us in, in a future Stat, uh, uh, Stat Chat uh, episode. And uh, until then, look forward to seeing you. All the best. Bye-bye.